And we're live! It's Tuesday, April 26th, and this is the eighth installment of Usenix's Lisa Conversations. I'm Lee Damon, a computing specialist at the University of Washington. And hello, I'm your co-host, Tom Lomincelli. I'm a site reliability engineer at stackoverflow.com, broadcasting today from a hotel in Portland, Oregon. Each month, Lisa Conversations brings you a speaker from a past Usenix conference to discuss their presentation and find out, hey, what's new? If you're watching live, we'd love to have your questions. There should be a Q&A button in the upper corner of your screen. If you see instead a 3 by 3 grid of dots, go ahead and click on that, and that should bring up the Q&A button. We'd love to have your input. Please do give us a question. In this episode, we'll be talking with Casey Claffey of the Center for Applied Internet Data Analysis, SCADA, and her collaborators, Van Jacobson from Google, who will be showing up later, and uh, Lixia Zhang, a professor of computer science at UCLA. Casey gave a talk at Lisa 15 titled Named Day Networking. Um, Casey Van Lixia, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. We always open up with three questions, so uh, we'll just go ahead and fire off. Um, each of you will, will answer, and then we'll move on to the next question, I guess, probably be the easiest way to do this. Uh, tell us what you do. Uh, I uh, lead a research group at the University of California, San Diego. I've done it for over 20 years, uh, studying the internet, various kinds of measurement, data analysis. Gotten more lately into the economics and policy side of it because so much seems blocked on issues with policy and economics. And Alicia? Um, well, Chris is younger than me. And actually, I've been in this internet business for, let me say, exactly 35 years. I started in uh, 1981 when uh, TCPIP spec got published. So then, studied the internet, the design, the architecture, the protocols, and everything else. Cool. So, um, Casey, I assume fantastic, you, fantastic. I assume your position hadn't changed since you gave the talk last um, November. No, no. You <laughs> Could you explain at a quick high level, like, you know, two minute, really fast or really slow elevator ride pitch, um, what the talk was about? Right. So the title was A, a Brief History of a Future Internet, uh, the Name Data Networking Architecture. And I was trying to give a bit of a motivating talk, but really trying to bring the Sysadmin community into the fold of what's going on in the research community with respect to at least one pretty prominent project called NDN, Name Data Networking. So this is a five-year-old project, at least, depending on how you measure. I think, actually, Van Jacobson gave the first Google Tech Talk on this idea back in 06, I want to say. So that's 10 years old. But in terms of the National Science Foundation putting chunks of money into it, it's about five years, um, maybe a little bit more. But uh, there's been a number of different projects. In fact, you know, about 10 years ago is when the, I, these ideas of future internet architecture projects were taking off around the world over the last 10 years. Lots of different pockets of research in this space have come up, so we're really just one, one of, of many. And uh, However, I will say that there's a flavor of, of future internet architecture projects that capture an idea that, that we're a part of, and the flavor is called information-centric networking. In fact, by this time, there's an IRTF working group uh, dedicated to information-centric networking called ICNRG. Uh, research group. There's a uh, conferences. There's an annual conference called ICN, which started out as a workshop attached to SIGCOM, I think, and now it's its own conference. So there's a lot of intellectual momentum behind this idea of if we were going to build if we were going to build a new protocol architecture from scratch, how would we do it? And then a lot of people have converged on a set of common ideas for how you would do that. That still have different flavors among those among that main set of ideas. And that set of ideas is focused on the fact that what we're mostly doing with the internet today is moving around chunks of information, which is not actually sort of abstractly aligned with the model of the either the internet architecture or communication architectures that have preceded it. So that was it. I gave a little bit of nuts and bolts, but really a high-level overview of what is this project, why should systems care, how much should they care at this point, that kind of stuff. So before we get into the nuts and bolts, do you have any any um, updates that you want to want to give on anything that you've since the presentation? Well, I'll let Leisha advertise sort of recent code releases and stuff because one I think really unique and exciting thing about this project is there's code. There's really code you can download and play with. It's all open source, and 
Um, and there's even a test bed that you can attach to if you're so inclined. So I'll let her do the updates, but I will do one advertisement for a workshop that's coming up if you're interested, either now or after you hear this talk. Um, even NIST, another U.S. federal agency, Institute of Standards and Technology, has decided that NDN is a project of sufficient significance that they're going to have a workshop on it angled toward uh, Internet of Things and big data. Uh, and that workshop is going to be in D.C. at NIST on March 31st, and there's a registration page up, and I'll send a link to you guys. I guess I can even put it in the chat window. Thank you. Well, May 31st, not March. I'm sorry, what did I say? May 31st and June 1st. Thank you. Two-day workshop in D.C. So that's just a plug, and I'll repeat it at the end, maybe. I so, yeah, if you could go ahead and just put that in the notes. Uh, we'll ask Kim, our producer, to add that to the uh, doobly-doo, which would show up when people are viewing this after the live recording. Um, also, the URL for the code repo, if you could send us that. Yes. We'd like to add that to our I'll notes as well. I'll the project for the code is also... Okay. So, Alicia, so, you were going to give us some, some information? Oh, yeah. New um, code? No, I don't have much more to say. I think if you just go to our uh, uh, the code base, where you can find the, the latest release. Uh, we release a code base periodically. Uh, that includes uh, both uh, the, like the forwarding, the basic uh, uh, forwarding nodes, as well as a set of libraries uh, to support the applications, and together with uh, uh, a number of applications that is run over the NDN network. And uh, as a bonus, we also have an uh, NDN simulator that is uh, widely used uh, by people around the globe uh, to conduct the uh, NDN uh, experiments because the test bite is still rather limited in size. We actually have a uh, global scale test bite across uh, three continents. But the number of nodes is tiny. It's only 30 uh, plus. But using simulators, you can really simulate a large scale uh, NDN network behavior. So we have this package called the NDN SIM. And uh, according to uh, Google scholars, it had so far about 250 citations. Um, so that really says how many people are actually using this package. Uh, to, uh, so you're getting some good uptake. That's excellent. Yeah. So for those of you who are too anxious and can't wait for it to show up in the doobly-doo later, uh, it's a fairly simple URL. It's named-data.net, N-A-M-E-D-D-A-T-A dot N-E-T. Go have a look in there, but wait until after the conversation because, you know, we want you to listen <laughs> to what we're saying here. Uh, so, so, Kim. I'm sorry, go ahead and talk. So let, let's back up a little. Um, uh, so I heard two things that may, uh, you know, may be a little difficult to, to digest for some people. And uh, So one was that, you know, the internet isn't perfect and, um, you know, that there's room for a, a second generation. Um, actually, why don't, why don't we start there? So, um, I mean, you know, I get on Facebook. I... Uh, find out what my mom did with her friends, you know, this weekend. What's what's broken with the internet? Okay, I'll take a I'll take a whack and then Lisa can fill in the gaps here. Um, right. So one thing to keep in mind is that Facebook is a good example of a um, an architecture, a platform that's sort of layered on top of the existing internet. And although it seems to work for you, it seems to work it works for you because of a lot of um, complexity that's been added on top of the IP architecture to make it look basically like an information distribution network for you. Um, it's not the case, though, that IP is a natural platform for building such information distribution networks. So the real challenge here is, in fact, you know, let, let me go back a, a few steps or a century or so. What is the IP architecture? What is the fundamental communication abstraction there? It's actually a point-to-point -point channel. An IP address identifies the end of a channel. And in order to establish communication in IP, you set up two endpoints of a channel. It actually sounds a lot like a telephone network. It actually is a lot like a telephone network. It's exactly like a telephone network, except for one very cool, brilliant intellectual contribution, which is packet switching. So they virtualize the channel. Rather than make it a constant 64 kbps channel that you set up, you, set up, you add this incredible amount of flexibility by making the channel virtual, and then you can do all sorts of things, including efficiency, packet uh, distribution, and such. However, you still have this fundamental channel abstraction. And if you really think about the way we use the internet today, 
most of it, most of what we do, including the Facebook example, is not really about setting up a channel and communicating across the channel. And it turns out trying to secure that channel has been a persistently unsolvable or not easily solved problem over the last 30 years. So there's all sorts of complexities and management difficulties that come with the IP architecture. And let's not forget, it wasn't designed to be an internet architecture, as in global internet communication substrate to replace the telephony system and have all of our banking and medical care and elections or whatnot on it. It was really designed to do a fairly um, much smaller, much less ambitious task, which was originally it connect up supercomputer centers, connect up uh, computing facilities that were funded by the U.S. government and sort of leverage the investment in these computing facilities so that other people could get access to those facilities uh, without having to build their own supercomputers. So it was, and it was also more importantly built for a trusted environment. So you set up a channel between here and another computer across the country, but everybody who's using the network is, you can assume is trusted. So there's no concern about man in the middle attacks when you originally designed the internet architecture. Um, it's not that they didn't think about security, it's that they were really designing for a different kind of environment than what we're, what we're using it for today. So I will say that nobody has ever tried to design an internet architecture where internet is pointing to what we do today with the, the global internet. Um, so then so, back to... So, so what I hear you saying is what we... Um, the original design is basically um, reflected what we had on our desk. We had on, on our desk was a telephone, so every time we connect to a machine, we're connecting like we're making a phone call. Um, and but what we do today is we we download information and we that say pictures and photos that um, and web pages that probably everyone else is also trying to download the same thing. So like a, a CDN. Which is why CDNs are so popular. Indeed, and CDNs are essentially building an information-centric architecture on top of IP. And so, really, the nugget, the nugget, the most important nugget of what NDN is trying to do and other similar projects is: what if you could have support, architectural support for what we're trying to do with the internet at the network layer? How would that enable you to build build applications more easily, secure applications more easily, manage networks more easily? And sort of solve some of the persistently unsolved problems that we do have with the internet architecture, including getting access to three billion people that don't have access to yet. Access to mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? That answers part of the question, maybe not all of the question. Anyway, so back to the, the communication abstraction. The internet really just uses the same communication abstraction as the telephony network in that it's a point-to-point -point communication channel. Now, I don't want to detract from the immense intellectual contribution of what packet switching was and what the IP architecture is. It's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing that it could actually accomplish what it's accomplished, given that it wasn't designed for that at all. It's operating way outside of spec, and it's doing it fabulously well, depending on your metric. But people who like Sysamins, who have to manage those networks and secure those networks, realize that you know things could be better underneath the hood, actually. And that's what we're trying mm -hmm. to do. So, so with the name data networking, can you give us a, an example of, say, getting a 1,000-byte static image? How would that work in the new the new world? Right. So I have to like bring up my slides from when I did this. Or do people get access have access to my slides? Maybe I should put a point. There'll, there'll be links to them in the. Yeah. So I do a I do an example of how data, the most fundamentally simple data communication works in NDN. And there's all and, and so I'm going to do the simple version. And Leisha's going to fill in the gaps again, hopefully here. Getting a, a small file. The two things that have to happen are the file needs to be published. The file needs to be sort of announced that it exists on the internet, and it needs a name. So the N, the first N in NDN is name, meaning every piece of content has a name. That's critically important. And usually, whenever you have a question about NDN, the answer is it's in the namespace. <laughs> the secret sauce is the namespace. Now, that like opens up a trillion research questions that we'll get to. But the first thing you have to do to make a piece of data available is issue it as a, as a name. And you announce it to the network, just like you announce a BGP pre prefix today. That is, you, you, you went out, well, not just like, but let's use that as an analogy because people understand that. So you would issue, um, uh, you would sort of let your namespace be known, and we can talk about, you know, ways of accessing what is the name of the content that you want. But the, the, the packet doesn't get sent, the content does not get sent unless somebody's asked for it. So the other packet, the other type of packet in the, in the NDN architecture is an interest, and that's a packet where you emit a request for a piece of data identified by its name. So the way you would do this 1,000-byte uh, packet is 
assuming that packet is published, and that's where we can, I'm going to let Leisha answer that question, we, but like assuming that packet has a name to it, you would issue a request for that name. And it would, it would propagate upstream. In fact, you could, and this is where some, there's sort of routing policy, what we think of today as routing policy in each node, uh, imagine that every router that receives that interest propagates it up every interface that it has. Maybe in local area network, this makes some sense. There's obviously some scaling things we have to talk about in the global internet, but conceptually, that's what it is. Every router that gets an interest propagates it upstream and also keeps a record in its, in its information base. Let's call it a PIT, call it a pending interest table, which is a record of pending interest, interest for data that have not yet been satisfied. So the, the interest packet propagates up. I need a whiteboard behind me. I'll have to draw my wall or something. And then the first router that has it, and each router could cache it, again, depending on policy and economics and all this stuff, uh, can respond to that interest packet following exactly the path that the interest came. So one very inter inter intellectually interesting part of the Indian architecture is unlike IP, routes are paths of information, interest in inf and, and responses to the interest for information, interest in information are symmetric. So the, the, the responding packet, the content, always comes back the same um, path that the interest went up. You can think of it as, and it's in some of the description of the architecture, that the interest moving up or moving out, propagating across the internet, leave kind of a breadcrumb uh, inside each node that then knows that somebody who, has, who is reachable by that router has asked for that content. And so when the content comes back, the router knows where, which interfaces to forward it, it's which interfaces the interest came in on. So you don't have an explosion. Oh, wow sort of a broadcast explosion coming back because each router knows exactly which interface is asked for it. So can that, you give us an example of a Oh, now everybody's talking. <laughs> okay, please. Can you give that a of a name? Could you give us an example of a name? What would a oh, name sure. look like? An example of a name, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sound a little bit like DNS, but let's make it sound a little bit like DNS. We don't want to break everybody's brain too much, but let's say slash edu, slash ucla, slash cs, slash Lisa, Lisha, slash, you know, CS101. That might be the name of where she puts her class materials for a certain class. So using the example of a web browser, class materials, web browsers tend to go together. I've just opened my web browser. I want to see the page for CS101. What is my web browser going to do? Because it doesn't know. I mean, right. just like now we have DNS that says, oh, go to google.com or whatever. What is, what is the well, initial well, conversation going to be to find out the name? Leisha, I'm going to let you answer it. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, this is in, in progress, this part of the architecture, but. Uh, for this part, actually, you know, we're more or less near that, right? You can think of that uh, in the end, conceptually. I only talk conceptually, not the detail. details are very different. But conceptually, <laughs> you can think of that and then get rid of all of this uh, DNS to IP address translation. Instead, you just drag the HTTP uh, request response the network layer. So therefore, your host, uh, your, web, your browser issue this uh, URL request, and uh, the Indian routers can literally take that URL and figure out what to forward the request to bring back the data you are asking for. Uh, that is about how Indian works. Just so think about this, the HTTP request response at the network layer so that we get rid of the name to address translation entirely. Cool. And Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, and also, I just want to add a bit uh, to uh, what uh, DC, uh, Casey mentioned earlier. I think that uh, uh, when we say name the data or content-centric, that data and the, uh, content should not be narrowly interpreted as like web page, uh, you know, movies, or streams. As a broadly interpreted any bits, I think about what a network does. It delivers the bits. And that's it. You think about it, it's just it delivers the bits. Uh, except that today we deliver the bits through a rather complex process. You know, bits to the applications, they actually all have names no matter how you call it, right? You know, for URLs, it's already URL is a name. Uh, even for emails, right? There's an email sent to whom, from whom. Email has identities. Uh, even think about these days, we have uh, IoT, Internet of Things. You collect data from sensors. 
And each of those pieces of uh, sensing data has some identity. So you know that you collected, uh, say, temperature from your living room, for example, that's not from your bedroom. So they all have identities. Uh, just that to the network level, those content or data identity are gone. Uh, instead, IP size, give me the address I deliver it. Uh, so there, therefore, we have to go through this uh, translation from name to addresses. It's not a simple translation because there isn't uh, one to one name to address mapping. Uh, so when you directly use names to communicate at a metric level, it gets rid of a bunch of questions. So, so don't think that uh, it's uh, dragging the uh, URL to another layer. It's a, it's a conceptual symbol. But uh, uh, if you think it deep, it gets rid of lots of questions or problems we actually have to do. A simple mm -hmm. example, you know, in my office, say that you want to get to the temperature. You know, my office has those three temperature sensors. When you ask a question, what is the temperature in Visha's office? It's a very simple question you can just ask. And if the sensors all have uh, wireless Wi-Fi access or otherwise connected to the same internet, one question any of the three guys can answer. Very simple, right? You throw out the question, someone right. will answer, that's it. But in IP, you have to think about, no, 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 you cannot ask that question. The first thing is, which address in the same question? Um, I, I see. So, so what I hear you saying is, with with traditional with IP networks, there's a couple lookups. There's the DNS lookup, and then you know IP to to MAC, and all these. There's a million look. Well, not a million, but there are many layers of, of redirection. And with this, with name, with MDN, it actually simplifies things because you just say, "I want this thing that has a name." And the network uses that, so we don't have to memorize IP addresses. <laughs> uh, that's right. You get rid of the, all the allocation, all the limitation of IP for address space and a bunch of other questions. But, um, Does that mean we don't have to use IPv6 anymore? <laughs> Lee, you have to use IPv6. <laughs> uh -huh. We'll get there later. Uh, but but uh, I just want to uh, supplement to what Casey mentioned earlier to say that back then, when TCP/IP was designed. You know, we only had uh, some very small number of uh, mainframes. I cannot call them supercomputers because their computation capability was rather limited. But, but uh, you know, the reason we need a new um, vertical architecture is because the world changed, right? Um, for accessing Facebook, that seems still pretty straightforward. But what if the cars running on the highways want to talk to each other? That question becomes rather difficult for IP to handle. But that's what we wanted to do. I don't know if people heard about the recent buzzword called smart cities. Uh, this is just the extension of uh, the Internet of Things. Now we actually we have, we turn everything to the Internet of Things interconnected. So therefore, we are going to get smart cities. This is an entirely new world. That when TCP/IP was designed, I mean, nobody had imagined uh, we would come to this stage. So therefore, the design didn't really uh, take into account of you know what all these uh, challenges that we are facing today. Uh, so, so talk about the next generation or future generation. Um, it's not so much like we love the word of next generation, but. Uh, the next generation of the world is here. And the question is, um, can the old protocol still uh, make the world forward fast enough? Or we really need a change so that we don't limit how we're going to build these smart cities, for example. So okay. Speaking of changes, wow. I want to remind everybody about the QA block. Uh, please remember to, to put in your questions. We are interested in what you have to say. Tom, I'm going to hand it over to you now. I've been you okay. twice. I, well, I'm, I'm, my words might be a little jumbled because I'm kind of blown away. Um, this is really um, 
uh, I guess I'm now understanding things that I, I guess maybe didn't sink in during the, the talk, that this is really, um, uh, I mean, I understood technically how radical it is, but now I'm understanding, like, the social impact, like, this, the way that this would impact uh, enable new applications because, um, you know, like like you said, cars, uh, I like your example, cars moving around, you know, they're mobile, they're changing location, and um, IP doesn't deal very well with that. We, we fake our way through it. Um, and um, Casey, what you said earlier about, like, the bread crumb, crumb trail, um, as someone who, I haven't done network routing in a while, but... Um, I used to, and I know it's only gotten more complicated. <laughs> and the idea of, um, uh, I mean, I have a lot of friends who, for a living, all they do is try to make BGP scale. And the idea of a breadcrumb, which it's like going from a big O n squared algorithm to big O n. I mean, it's there's the trail. Um, so that's that's really amazing. Yeah, you know, Alicia alluded to this before, but one way that we try to describe this architecture um, is, and that's not to say it is not totally mind-bending. It, it took me a few years to get my head around it, and I wouldn't say that I've totally succeeded, but um, is to think of it as a generalization of IP, where IP addresses are also names. They only name devices. In fact, they only name interfaces on devices, which is really annoying when you're trying to map the Internet, but that's a whole other talk yeah. show. <laughs> Um, but they, but think about it, you could name, I mean, you could, you could name an interface, you could name a router, you could name, uh, obviously, all the content, you could name commands to, for the router to do something. So I think that a very simple conceptual generalization of the IP architecture where instead of having an IP address, identify an endpoint of a communication channel, you have a name, identify almost anything, right? A, a piece of content, a device, a command, a, signa a cryptographic signature on something. And we haven't even gotten to the signature part, which is another sort of really important building block of the of the NDN architecture that um, you know IP doesn't have, and, and it's hurting us a lot because all those things that work so fabulously well to us, they work so far as we know, because <laughs> we can't really see under the hood, although some systems can. They work because of incredible layers of complexity that have been added onto IP because IP wasn't designed to support any of these applications. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, an and another thing that happens, an example I gave in the talk, is that for content distribution, you know, Alicia is very, always very cautious to make sure people don't think of this as, oh, it's just making IP a CDN. No, no, no. It's really much much bigger and broader than that, much more sort of revolutionary, revolutionary than that. And yet also conceptually, it's just simplifying. It's just sort of, it's just sort of generalizing what all the, generalizing the IP architecture, which has allowed us to sort of take all the good things, all the fabulously great things that the IP architecture gave us, the narrow, the narrow ways being one of them, which I don't know how many folks are familiar with it, but the I IP representing the narrow ways of the, of the Internet architecture allows a lot of stability at the network layer where IP is, but tremendous innovation uh, above and below um, because everything, as long as everything's converted to IP from top down and bottom up, then you can do whatever you want above and beneath. And we're trying to kind of pave the way for the same sort of power to be enabled by the NDN architecture. It's just that the narrow waste has changed from the IP addresses to something more general. So is the fact that IP addresses are basically just names a shim you could use to do the conversion from TCP IP to name data networking? Is that one way you envision replacing our current network? I see Alicia nodding, so I'm going to let her answer that question. I will say that Van, all the way through, has said that the deployment path is overlay. Much like, and I think people lose sight of this, the deployment path for IP was really an overlay. It was as an overlay on the telephony system for like 30 years, and then eventually when economics demanded it, uh, they pulled out the underlay. They just pulled out and they started doing everything over IP. Or we're still in the process of this phase change, but uh, I think Van, I think to try to channel Van, um, he would say, if it if NDN is successful, that would probably be the most likely success trajectory. Lisa, am I? Yes, yeah, I think this is exactly right. I think I want to uh, uh, repeat what Chris said just a moment ago about the uh, NDN is really a generalization of uh, what what IP can do. So therefore, if you say, um, can we do can the NDN do exactly the same thing like like the TCP/IP does? Yes, exactly. You can do that. You can think of the 
Sorry, it's my computer. <laughs> uh, the fallback IP before address is, is it just a, a special form of the name. So the R file is for in the end to do exactly the same thing. You can just use that um, um, at the address of the name that the directory interest to specific interface. Uh, you can do exactly the same thing. But uh, again, I agree with KC, the most useful task to go out in the end is now to imitate what it TCPIP does, because that doesn't really give you additional uh, functionality as needed by applications, right? So, so therefore, what we imagine, again, like KC size, is repeat exactly what happens with uh, the IP rod. You know, IP really enabled computers to talk to each other, uh, so that uh, uh, you know, you can send email in those early days. Uh, but uh, there's no direct uh, uh, computer to computer IT connectivity. So, therefore, you know, in the early days, we all did the DevOps. Uh, use the telephone connection to uh, send the IP packet over. And the same thing can be done with uh, NBN, where, you know, it should develop applications on top of NBN. You can do many amazing things if you get a chance to talk about that. Uh, but IP cannot, cannot do. But uh, you know how you get all this NDN enabled applications to talk to each other. Given that we don't have NDN routers deployed in any large scale, per se. Uh, so therefore, you're going to use IP as a connectivity to uh, carry the NDN packets to remote locations. You know, nearby, and then can run over Wi-Fi, over Ethernet, Bluetooth. Uh, we all have that implemented, uh, but over multiple hubs. Uh, what do you do? Well, use IP connectivity. Uh, so this is a, a kind of an overlay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, just getting back to the the technical details. Um, well, not that technical, but. Um, so you know all of these routers are are processing these names and also caching information. Does that mean we expect uh, routers to have you know a, a large amount of storage so that they can um, kind of be like you know everything every router becomes part of the CDN? Um, say this way, right? So first of all, the routers do have lots of memories in these states. Uh, that even come to the degree we had this uh, buffer float problem. That's because when packets get cached, well, get buffered at the doctors. So that's one, mm -hmm. one answer. Uh, but uh, also, you think about this way. That is, if there is uh, uh, some hot contents demanded by more than just one uh, end user, even if you just have, like, you know, the one packet that being fetched by two users, in order to save uh, the bandwidth. How big the uh, content store or cache a router may have is up to you know the economical factor, uh, the technologies. What is the cheapest, and you can save the most bandwidth. Right? But also, I want to tell you a story. So I was actually in sabbatical in Japan uh, last winter, and uh, one day. A couple of people from uh, Fujitsu, I believe, uh, came to visit me. I was uh, at the Keio University. And they started by saying that, oh, we heard that you are doing an NDN project, and that requires the routers who have caches. How big a cache do you need? At the very beginning, I wasn't sure where they were heading to. So I said, well, you know, how much cache it depends on the, the technology factor, the economical factor. And they said, OK, we really want you to use as much cash as possible. It turned out that those you know, traditionally the big manufacturer for SSDs, they really think that the technology has come to the stage where you can have a huge amount of uh, memory uh, with a very low cost. And they are interested in understanding how you can make the best use of such large scale, low cost memory. So that actually answers a question I was just about to ask, which is, how much interest have you gotten from Cisco and, and other companies about 
how they can add on to their hardware and their costs <coughs> by uh, enabling this today as opposed to five years from now. Have they, have they been in, in conversation with you guys about this at all? Do you want me to do that, Lisa? You want to address that? Uh, I will say yes. The answer is yes. Companies are interested. In fact, we have, we'll do another plug. There's something called the Endian Consortium that any, any company or university or, any, or anybody can join, uh, which is a, a way for us to kind of have a channel of communication, not just the NSF academic centric channel of how do we get all of our papers published in the code release and stuff, but sort of a conversation with commercial folks uh, and inter lots of international interest too on how do we kind of be responsive to their needs. I will say the Cisco, um, my understanding at least, I haven't talked to them lately, of course any commercial company has a bit of a shorter term uh, time horizon. So I think if you see router vendors like Cisco and Ericsson get involved, it's probably going to be on the, on the line, along the lines of how do we get something we can sell in, in two years. That's a long time for a company, right? Uh, and so I think you may end up seeing, and probably you saw the same thing in the history of IP, let's see if we can solve some smaller problem and not boil the ocean, not like get every single application that we can think of an IP working, but let's just do something better than what's ha what's happening right now in the commercial world with the CDN. Let's get something maybe that Netflix can use, or you know, I'm, I don't know anything, I'm just throwing out examples. To sort of, again, NDN or any, any similar architecture would just sort of need to prove its mettle on small problems in order for it to get some increasing, you know, gain ground, get traction. Uh, so are, so are companies like Akamai? interested attending our meetings. We have annual meetings. But I don't know. I, I, we're not privy to questions like how much cash is going to go in the router. Let me say one thing, though, about that question, because I love that question because it's a perfect IP type of thinking question. And I don't mean to call you the equivalent of a bellhead in 1995, because I asked this question, too, for three years. Like, well, how is this going to work? How are all the routers going to And let's get to routing, and it's the same kind of question. Like, how are you going to route on billions of names? But really, I think we're, if, if Indian is going to have a payday, it's going to be in a world where almost everything, like literally our shoes, right, has storage. So it's a completely different model than how do I make sure there's enough storage in that big router that Cisco's selling. It's how do I effectively leverage the fact that there's storage in almost everything I touch, mm -hmm. right? It's an incredibly sure. empowering idea that definitely needs some network architect thinking about how to leverage it, and we're, we're kind of aiming for that where that puck is going to be, I think. Not that we don't have to answer these other questions, but the answer isn't nearly as romantic. I think it's going to come down to economics. It's always going to come down to economics, but definitely in the next two years it's going to come down to economics that we don't have any control over. I'm sorry, shoes are not allowed to have storage. That's too much of a redefinition of sneaker net. Okay. <laughs> um, sweaters? Can sweaters have storage? Sure, sure. Sweaters. Sweaters, sweaters are already collecting data. They need storage. That's right. I, I, think, I mean, I, so that's another thing I'll tell Tom because I can see his head, you know, things are rattling around his head, is that I kind of, I'm the resident skeptic about NDN. I mean, I'll come in and I'll say, this is never going to work, you guys. And then I'll go out into the world, and like something will happen to me on an airplane, in an airport, in a meeting, and I'll, be, and I'll think to myself, God, NDN would solve this problem. And I think like Van is 20 years ahead of us all because he came up with this thing 10 years ago. And he's kind of patiently waiting for the rest of the world to catch up to realize there are so many problems and opportunities that NDN would, would bring to us that... Um, it's just slow going, unfortunately. We're going the pace of academic research, which is slower than what the world would like, I think. <laughs> yeah, I really... Well, I, I think um, sweaters would have storage, but it would be static storage. <laughs> Dude, you have like a dog sure. sound? <laughs> <laughs> moving, moving right along. Um, so so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an assertion, and then we'll move on. I'm assuming that basically we're, we're tossing out the seven-layer cake. It, it well, is... It is it, is, it never actually applied anyway, and so at this point we can just stop talking about it. Uh, well, the seven layer, you mean the, the hourglass thing, right? No, I'm talking about the ISO standard. Eh, um, but that had the, I mean, we, 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 the academic, the U.S. academic community, always, always uh, superimposed the hourglass on top of that seven layer thing, and then we kind of ignored some of the layers, right? So we never really did. I, I guess only if you went to good schools. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> because yeah. I, I only got the seven layer cake where I went to school. Yeah, uh, layers eight and nine still apply, but the the other, I, I I think we can probably continue ignoring the seven layer. Okay, I like the hourglass. That's a that's a much more meaningful description, yeah. I think, than yeah, the than right. the ISO standard. I sorry, ISO standard seven layer cake. Yeah. 
Mm. I also want to just inject a small comment to the really question regarding Cisco, whether Cisco is interested or not. Um, I'd like to make it very clear that in rolling out a new architecture, I want to uh, at least articulate my thought of who is the boss. You know, not long ago, I was in a workshop uh, talk about the Internet of Things, so that uh, people were saying that, oh, Google is a big player there, and Apple is a big player there, and how much we got to say as, as like a user community. Uh, and the two dictate what gets sold, and they don't want to agree on anything standardized. Uh, and I stood up, I said, look, guys, who is the real boss? It's not Google. It's not Apple. It's actually you and me, i.e., the end users. So the same thing is about a new architecture. It's not the Cisco or Juniper or, or the ATT and that like. They're going to decide whether they're going to deploy ND or not deploy ND. But rather, it's really the edge users, the edge applications. If the NDN can really make it easy to write new applications, that's where NDN will get picked up. Um, whether the ATT or Verizon like ND or not, I hope they better like it. But uh, what I want to say is that it doesn't really matter. This is the traffic. The traffic eventually, you know, from the new application is going to drive the world. That's how IT got deployed. You know, the big guys at the time, back then, 30 years, uh, didn't like IT at all. Not at all. You know, they, they literally, when I went to visit the Bell Labs, they told us, you guys were crazy. You have no clue how you can build uh, reliable communication systems. Uh, this is crazy. IP thing going to go away in just a few years. How great and how credible you are. Because they didn't anticipate that it was the end applications that produce the traffic and that actually drive uh, drive the changes in the infrastructure. So uh, being I, will, I will slightly I will slightly modify. I mean, I would slightly add to that that I think those companies do ma do matter, but I think the historical trajectory of IP is such that it had a great, uh, incredible. Uh, historically significant uh, push by the US government. So without, for example, the ARPANET, the NSFNet backbone, which was really that piece, but after which we realized, OK, that's a nice military testbed thing that connects up our you know, DOD funded supercomputers. But uh, what do we do now that the CEO, the CIOs of universities, okay, we didn't have CIOs back then, but whatever. What do we do now that upper management of universities are using it to send email to each other? Oops, we better get somebody else in there who can build general purpose infrastructure. And NSF, now there was obviously lots of conversations among big people, I don't know, but uh, NSF came in and supported a national general purpose r and &E network infrastructure that allowed those applications that Alicia is talking about at individual campuses and regional networks to connect to each other. And I think without that, I don't, I don't know that we would have gotten the internet that we see today. Maybe eventually some other way, but of course that's... that's gonna, probably going to take a much longer happen today. So, yeah. so I'm, I'm a cynic. I acknowledge this fact. I, I, am, I am bitter and jaded. Um, my big concern is the companies like Akamai and companies that are currently monetizing the way things are now are going to be your biggest lead bricks, the ones dragging us backwards and trying to stop this from happening. I don't know that Akamai is, you know, I should not have mentioned them by name, but, but the people who benefit from how things are now tend to be the most reluctant to, even if they know that it could be better for them, they, they tend to fight hardest against the change. Have you seen any of this yet? Are we still under the radar? Is that where we are, or is this something that you're worried about? Um, I don't think I'm worried about that. As a matter of fact, we're not that much under the radar. So uh, ICOMA actually knows about India. As a matter of fact, I don't think they don't like us. I think they probably like us. ICOMA faces challenges. Um, as everybody does. Uh, but in particular, we had uh, some well-known challenges. Why is a security issue? Well, I wouldn't say I come. I just say that the CDN companies in general, right, they become the middleman. 
that is, it transparently delivers the very important part, uh, data. Not only just the CNNs or the Netflix, but also even come to your bank account, for example. That may not be uh, well known. Uh, the CDNs become so important, so useful, uh, the you know, enterprises use them as a, the first line um, of defense against the DDoS attacks and other attacks. So lots of um, unlikely customers for uh, CDN uh, business these days. The, uh, in the middle man, uh, you have lots of critical uh, security challenges. I think that maybe now there's a broadcast, I probably don't want to disclose too much details. But a uh, different uh, type of challenge is they always have this problem of figuring out, you know, for a given uh, customer, the client, which of the CDN boxes would be closest to that guy so that you can redirect the uh, web request to the nearest the CDN box. I don't think they ever solved that problem. So all of those things, um, if you just think about um, the names, that you do routing on names, in the routing, always find out the nearest uh, neighbors. If you think that way, I think that can help the CDN company actually address their existing challenges. They could adapt in the end as an approach to build a better uh, CDN systems uh, as well. Yeah, it's just really different ways of thinking, looking at the picture. Yeah, as, a, as a matter of fact, you know, we actually started uh, slowly, some collaboration um, with uh, people associated with the academy. That's good. That's, that's you know, like I say, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a cynic and a pessimist. So, <laughs> yes. always, always is the case. You know, like 35 years ago, I gave a talk at a large telephone company, and maybe 35 years ago, there was only lo one large telephone company, so you can right. de it yourself. And they said. I gave a talk about the internet. I was a graduate student or something. I guess it wasn't 35 years ago. It feels like it. But uh, I gave. I said everything I know about the internet. It only took me like 20 minutes, right? And he said, that's it? Like, how do you manage this thing? Uh, and I, I said, I don't know. I'll go finish my PhD and let you know. Uh, they were, I mean, I think always you're going to have incumbents be resistant to new technology. That's kind of their job, right? You, you see some, you see sort of, a, um, I think, divergent from that, uh, position today as technology is moving so fast, but somebody's got to keep the, the lights on and the, the routers running. But indeed, and, you know, and another thing is people talk about how could you possibly replace the replace the current internet? There's such an incredible embedded infrastructure, but it's only been 40 years since there was any internet. That's like zero amount of time in the history of communications fabrics. So. I, I think people ought to, I mean, I too was like that five years ago. This is never going to work. And now I'm thinking 40 years is not that long. We'll all probably still be alive in 40 years. So, yes, big companies will resist, but that's always the case. But I would pick up uh, what the case you mentioned earlier about the government uh, investment into the Internet. That, I think that really played a critical uh, role in getting the Internet technology out quick uh, to invest into the the basic research, make it a, a usable, um, system, build a usable system, and after that, the commercial market you know, saw the gains and figured it out. Yeah, I personally think it will, it, it will probably take that again, or at least that would be the best trajectory. It's not universally held inside Washington that they should go build another NSF net or something like that, but um, but I think uh, it is recognized that NDN is already solving problems for big data scientists, like high energy physicists, who need to move huge chunks of data from CERN to Fermilab. And frankly, IP is not doing it, TCP rather, is not doing it for them. Uh, and we have a, a paper published in the High Energy Physics Conference last year, uh, Krista is one of our PIs at Colorado State, who basically demonstrated how much better NDN is as a paradigm for solving the problem of moving big scientific data around. Now, of course, you may think, okay, that's kind of a corner case, big scientific data, but, you know, tomorrow that's our movies. <laughs> that's not that big compared to what yeah. we're using the, the commercial internet for today. But I think that there is a role to play for the, for the government here. Maybe we, none of us have really figured out exactly what it is yet. But it's, I'm very happy to see that the sci big, sci big data scientists are already kind of seeing 
uh, seeing it a compelling enough idea to start experimenting with NDN for their own needs. That's the way it's going to have to work, is it solves problems for people, like Alicia says, at the edge, or maybe two edges, you know, two edges hopefully connected by a high bandwidth network, and then maybe somebody decides, gosh, it would be good if we connected some more of these regional high bandwidth networks. I mean, that's more or less how it, how it grew, although there was some top-down and bottom-up happening for the IP, IP backbones back in the 80s and 90s, too. I think we just uh, talked about how great the NDN is, almost like a, something a science fiction, as if magic can happen. You know, NDN can do sensors, little, little sensors, gazillions of them, and the NDN can move huge data petabytes uh, for scientists. But we haven't really said much about exactly how it works yet. Uh, I guess uh, the talk maybe is a little too short to get into details. So I would just say in one sentence, you just think about the network is moving the bits. Okay, either the sensor data is a bit, or otherwise uh, science petabytes of data is also just a bit. So in the inside, let's name those bits. And then uh, someone requested the bits, and whoever has the data will supply. That is a basic amount. With that, you can try to put the pieces, uh, both and knots together, and uh, uh, to construct such a, such a world. One thing really is overview we should have said earlier. That is, uh, I think I imagine the world with lots of bits flowing by, each pair is named, and you can request the bits, it will come, because in the end, you know, just think about the name, it doesn't have an address. So therefore, exactly where the bits come from, uh, you have no clue. So how do you know you get the red bits? And that's actually a key point in, in the end. That is, we secure the bits directly. We don't depend on secret channels. So every uh, bag of bits, we call the package, uh, will carry a crypto signature. Like it finds the name of the bits with the bits themselves, so that you can easily authenticate the bits you received uh, to make sure that you get the right data. You know, had we been able to verify every bit everyone receives, then we would substantially reduce the security threats on today's internet. Lisa just like opened up a whole other hour of conversation that we don't have time to do today. Let's come back, come back next year and do that. But I want to throw out on that point. I want to throw out a challenge to the Lisa audience of just think about you know abstractly the next time you have a big problem at work or even are roaming along in life, uh, and you think that IP, the IP architecture, might have something to do with it. You don't even have to be right about that. If you just suspect that IP might have something to do with it, send an email to us and just describe the problem abstractly, and we can sort of collect these maybe and have another, another talk show in the future about how we think NDN might mitigate that problem. I think you'd be amazed what you'll find. That, that could be quite That's interesting. Um, but that, that actually does bring up one last thing. I'm sorry, Tom. I'm going to take away that one question I offered you, and I'm going to, I'm okay. going to jump on this. Uh, Casey, you mentioned in your talk something about um, cutting down on spam because spammers can't send you email if you haven't asked for it, which immediately makes me think, well, how do I send email to someone to say, hey, um, we've never spoken before, but I'd love to interview you on my show. If I've never spoken with them before, how do I initiate that email conversation? But you know my email address. <laughs> I know your email address, but what, what if it's somebody who I haven't spoken with before and if I can't initiate the email conversation because they haven't asked for me to send them email, how does that work? Right. Um, Lisa's nodding her head. I think I'm going to let Lisa take that one. Well, you, you, people always think that email is a push application. But if you look into the details, is it, it really is? You know, say that you want to send me email. What is that first IP packet you actually send out? That's another one that carry a message. But that is actually a TCP SYN request to port 25. That is, your laptop is asking for permission to set up an SMTP connection with, with the email server. Right? So that until the unless email server agrees, you won't be able to send the message out. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, the spam filters actually make use of that, that fact. Uh, uh, they do you know, all sorts of checkings, uh, like one stupid one is a reverse yes lookup <laughs> to see are you a legit uh, box trying to set up SMTP connections. Yeah. 
so so therefore it's not so much of uh, uh, the people conceptually think at the application level there's all these push applications now you don't allow push uh, you look into the details there's no application as a one way data push there's always two way packet exchanges I think yeah. Lee wants to know the higher question of how you get the email address to which I guess we can just say search engines are not going away right you put it on your business card <laughs> uh, and also there's also the peer to peer uh, communications as how you can collect all the information as needed uh, and also so that if if I don't know you well Casey knows you that's how we met each other today right <laughs> this is a the referrals, the, the transitive trust that, that is, allows me to set up a trust with you to receive, to uh, allow your email messages to come into my box. Uh, good old change of trust. We know them so well. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. Like if you had mentioned, that's another talk, probably. That's another talk, yeah. There's yeah. more to that answer, Lee. We've, we've opened like three more conversa hour long <laughs> conversations in the last five minutes. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have any time for any of them. So I think we should actually start rolling out, you know, wrapping up at this point. Tom, did you have any, any last minute you want to do before I start asking uh, the firing questions? Before, I, I just want to say what an honor it is. I to have you on the show, um, all, all of you. Um, this is probably our most uh, prestige, prestigious uh, set of guests. So um, thank you for taking the time to be here. We really appreciate it. Yes, yes, seconded indeed. So I'm going to go ahead and, and read from the script now, um, <laughs> closing up this, this, this uh, show. Uh, really appreciate you guys being here. So that's all the time we have. Uh, we always close. We ask uh, three questions. Oh, okay. And um, these, these are rapid, rapid fire questions. Don't stop and think. Just give a quick answer. Uh, so are you ready for question number one? Do we well, both answer we do. Uh, we're we're, we're going to ask each of you. So you each get to answer all three questions. <laughs> OK. Uh, what are the questions? All right. First question is, what was your first computer, Casey? I know this one because I knew you were going to ask. Atari 800. All right. I know how old am six, I? I'm six eight hundred two. Lisha, I don't remember my own uh, first computer, but I remember the first computer I ever used as uh, Intel eighty eight. Oh. Uh, when I was first came to US uh, seventy nine, I was in the lab. They showed us this Intel eighty eight. So we write assembly language code for that. that also cool. Me. Cool. Okay, question number two. Um, have you ever had to press the big red switch that is the emergency power off button in a server room or data center? Definitely not. <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even have sudo on my own machine. <laughs> no, that's not totally true. No, I avoid that. I, I have better people than I for that stuff. Right, there are better people doing that work. Uh, I only had the honor to actually tour the data centers just, uh, I think, three times in my life. Not alone, let, let alone the opportunity to push that red button. So who was your favorite computer scientist or author? We'll start with Leisha. Oh, my. I'm such an ignorant person. Um, I cannot remember. But I do remember the... Just a generous speaking, uh, who are my most favorite author? You would not be able to guess it. Uh, there's actually Richard Feynman. I oh. I came to this country very much uneducated, and how did I learn how to do research? Reading Feynman's uh, the you know Feynman lectures on physics. He's, he's not just talking about the physics. He's talking about how to do research. Th that is. <laughs> I love that answer. Thank yeah. you. Casey? Uh, gosh, I have three answers. First, I want to repeat Todd Underwood's answers. He did this great Lisa conversation a couple months ago, and he mentioned Evie Nemeth. He's still my heart. And, um, uh, and Mark Burgess, which, which prompted me to go get back in touch with Mark and tell him all about NDN. And I don't know if, the, if your readers know, I don't know if he's given a Lisa talk lately, get him to give a Lisa talk on promise theory which is this idea that he's come up with a few years ago for, for systems and how to do DevOps in a better way this century than last. I think it's incredibly spiritual, spiritually aligned with NDN. 
for reasons that are another talk show. But uh, anyway, go look into that. But my personal, I will say, someone who I have the benefit of working with uh, a lot now is David Clark at MIT. And if Lisa is in Boston. I get to plug Lisa now. It's if it's in Boston in this year, get him to go give a keynote. He has a great talk on security he's been giving lately. You guys would love it. Well, if you talk about the best known author, Dave doesn't write much. Oh, okay. Okay, so well, author. it's uh, computer the scientist. Advisor. Oh, I didn't know it was author. I thought it was just computer scientist or author. No. Oh, okay. He writes papers, not books. He's working on a book on future network architecture, so stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> okay. Tom? Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, this is a great idea, this talk hey, show. Well, uh, thank you both for for coming here. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, I, I second I, that motion. Um, so that brings us to the end of this month's Lisa conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to our producer Kim from Usenix for all the backstage work. To our live listeners for their well, okay. I'm going to glower now. Not <laughs> one question came in. You guys are not doing your jobs. Not doing your homework. <clears throat> Do your homework. Yeah, watch the view. Watch the video before the talk. Uh, and and of course to our guests, to uh, to their, the hour that they spent with us and the planning and preparation time they spent beforehand. I really really have enjoyed and appreciated your 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 company today. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Take care. Mm -hmm. So our next conversation will be with Clay Clavinus and Edward Eigerman on May 31st, 2016. We hope to see you there. Uh, you'll find details about it on our website. This is Tom Lomincelli. And this is Lee Damon. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next month.